Well, I'm Peter Grodzinski from National Cancer Institute, and I will talk to you today about uh, the use of nanomaterials in new treatments and diagnostics uh, for cancer. In this discussion, I will not describe any specific nanomaterial. I would rather talk about how development of new nanomaterials in general can be used for important applications in medicine with uh, specific uh, interest in cancer. Cancer is a debilitating d disease. More than half a million of Americans die of cancer every year, and more than uh, 1.3 million people in this country are diagnosed with cancer uh, every year. So finding new treatments as well as new methods to diagnose this uh, difficult disease is very important. Um, and new nanomaterials and nanoparticles in particular uh, can be used in a number of different applications. New nanomaterials allow to develop new sensors. Uh, these sensors uh, can detect uh, <clears throat> bio um, markers or indicators of the disease at the early stage with very high sensitivity and also high specificity. Uh, many of these sensors can work in highly multiplex way meaning they can look at a number of different biosignatures at the same time, which for disease like cancer is very important because usually one biosignature doesn't uh, describe the uh, disease in, in its entirety. Uh, the nanomaterials and nanoparticles can also contribute to designing new contrast agents, which can be used in imaging of uh, tumor mass growing in the patient. Um, and uh, can be also used to deliver uh, different therapies. Uh, an advantage of the approach uh, uh, based on nanoparticles is such that uh, often delivery can be more localized, meaning more of the treatment and more of the uh, therapeutic which is carried by the, the uh, nanoparticle can be uh, allocated or accumulated at the tumor as compared to traditional um, chemotherapeutics which are used in contemporary uh, treatment right now. Uh, they also uh, uh, at times can be more effective, um, so you have a combination uh, of uh, uh, higher accumulation, high, higher effectiveness, and at the same time lower side effects. A lot of treatments which are being used uh, right now in medicine and in, clin in the clinic uh, are very uh, difficult for patients to stand because of the uh, side effects which treatment carries. Uh, the nanoparticle-based therapies should uh, uh, allow to avoid that. And I will show that and describe it in more detail in the uh, next slide. So what happens when you design a nanoparticle, which usually will be in terms of size range between 20 and 80 nanometers or so, uh, and then you use this nanoparticle as a carrier which can carry the particular cargo, whether it's an imaging agent or a particular molecule which acts as a, as a therapeutic treatment. Uh, an advantage of using the particle as a carrier uh, like that is that parting being very small has a very large surface to volume ratio. So in other words, if you inject a lot of particles, you'll be able to attach a lot of different entities which you are interested to deliver to the surface of these particles. And uh, having, for instance, 10 million particles, which are very small, will be, will be much more effective in carrying larger amount of therapeutic as compared to uh, 1,000 particles, which are much larger, which will be in, in several micron range. And there are also, of course, some other biological ramifications which prefer uh, deliver of small particles. But, but the example which I gave uh, just exemplifies uh, the advantage of um, surface to volume ratio. These particles, as traditional therapies, are being injected into the bloodstream uh, through um, IV injection, uh, and then they can circulate in the bloodstream much longer than traditional therapeutics. Uh, and because of that, during the circulation, which can last several hours, they pass the regions of the body which uh, uh, have uh, uh, tumor 
Uh, and uh, because of the long time of circulation, they will accumulate at the tumor site with higher um, effectiveness than uh, the ones which don't circulate that long, uh, which and which do not use uh, particles for for the delivery. These particles, and I will show that again in next slide, can be made by a number of different techniques. Uh, they can also not only vary slightly in shape, but they uh, in size, but they can also vary uh, by shape, uh, and they can also vary by um, chemical makeup. And in this little cartoon here, which now I activated, you see that uh, when you use the nanoparticle as a carrier, you can uh, attach now number of different entities uh, to this particle, which which will act as a carrier. And it can be, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, imaging agent, which will be able to um, show the size of the tumor uh, mass within patient's body, a therapeutic molecule, which will uh, allow to uh, treat and possibly er eradicate uh, the part of tumor tissue. And finally, uh, targeting moiety, which helps in finding the tumor and also helps in accumulation of the, of the particle and the cargo on the particle at the tumor site. So this will take us to another slide, which shows now number of different nanomaterials and nanoparticles which can uh, serve uh, roles <coughs> in delivery, as I shown in the previous slide. You may have heard about these materials from your reading or from uh, uh, different lectures in this series, uh, and I will just uh, read uh, briefly names of these nanomaterials or nanostructures. Uh, uh, you see liposomes, dendrimers, nanoshells, quantum dots, uh, small gold particles, uh, carbon nanotubes, fullerenes, polymers, and many others. The common denominator for all those which I mentioned is that they have small <clears throat> dimensions, usually uh, in the range uh, below <clears throat> 100 uh, nanometers. And they can be prepared using variety of materials. Some are organic, some are inorganic. And there is also a number of different fabrication techniques which allow to make these materials. What uh, is the demand which we put on the fabrication methodology is that uh, uh, the chemical makeup of these particles should be consistent and also the size distribution uh, of these uh, particles when appreciable uh, amount of, the, of them is being produced is narrow such that most of them uh, look alike, uh, are made from, similar, from the same material uh, and have uh, similar uh, dimensions. So now when, when these particles are first produced and then are decorated with appropriate cargo, which uh, they will be carrying into patient body, uh, eventually they will be injected or infused into patient body as a suspension uh, which will contain many, many particles, million or billion of them. Uh, because they are so small, uh, the dose like that will not be, uh, in terms of volume, will definitely not be that large. And uh, the objective of using a delivery approach like that is that we want to have uh, the uh, therapeutic cargo being delivered more specifically only to the organs which are diseased and which need and require treatment rather than to all organs. The traditional chemotherapy, which is depicted in the, in the graph uh, in, the, in the individual on the left, you see that body is uniformly colored. Uh, and the reason for that is that injection of the, of the, thera of the therapeutic essentially affects all organs, goes to uh, and affects cells in your entire body. And that's from 
where unfortunately the side effects, undesirable side effects of the current treatments come from. Uh, that simply not only sickly cells are being attacked, but also healthy cells are being attacked. And, and because of that, some of the bodily functions of the patient suffer, uh, even if we don't want them to be impacted, but we are not clever enough to, to design this treatment in such a way that it will be acting only on, uh, on sickly cells. Now, the nanoparticle deliver, of course, will not make it 100% specific, meaning it will affect only the sickly cells and other organs or other cells, not at all. But the specificity will improve. So because of that, we hope that uh, treatment will be more effective, and at the same time, uh, the side effects of the treatment will be uh, less uh, severe. Now, why nanoparticles, as I said several times, have capability of uh, mm, accumulating at the tumor uh, side, uh, side more preferably as compared to traditional chemotherapy where a small molecule drug gets injected directly into the, um, into the bloodstream. The effect responsive for that is EPR or enhanced permeability and retention effect. When particles, as I uh, mentioned earlier, circulate uh, for several hours, and again, that uh, uh, is up to creativity of particle designers and manufacturers to make them in such a way, and there is a involved biochemistry uh, at play here, uh, so they don't get removed uh, from the bloodstream uh, by the organism, or they don't get stuck <clears throat> to the blood vessel walls. Uh, the ones who are designed cleverly like that can circulate in the bloodstream for 20 hours or, or longer. So when they make several passages through tumor, uh, through blood vessels, they also pass um, the areas <clears throat> of the body where, uh, which is in proximity of tumors. Tumors are essentially uncontrollable areas of cell growth. Cells there grow faster than we want, grow in the ways which we don't want, and as such, the mass of this uh, of the cells growing overwhelms the <clears throat> organs and functions uh, of the body in its proximity and eventually can also spread to other parts of the body and affect even more organs but because this uh, growth occurs fairly quickly and of course what is needed for growth is nutrients which are distributed in the body by the blood flow, uh, the vasculature or new tumor vessels have to be developed also fairly rapidly in, around and inside of the tumor mass. Because they are developing more rapidly than uh, traditional or standard tumor vessels where uh, in the regions where growth <clears throat> Of, of cells and, and, and the replacement of the dying cells is much slower. The vasculature uh, growth around tumor is not as perfect and usually uh, vasculature is more leaky, meaning they're like a leaky pipe. The walls of them are not perfect and they have uh, smaller and larger holes. And nanoparticles which go through vasculature take advantage of that. When they pass through the vessels which are not, uh, which didn't develop walls as well as in the, as other parts of the body, they naturally don't have directionality in their flow, so they are capable of escaping. And again, because this vasculature is poorly developed in the tumor proximity, proximity so in a way nature uh, uh, provides an advantage to, to us in terms of how the drug can be developed, uh, the particles will escape and will end up in the proximity of the tumor. Now, if the particles, and it is shown graphically in this figure here, you see that there are walls, there are uh, holes in the walls here, and the particles will travel through the vascular. Suddenly, when they get to that region, they are able to 
to escape. Um, and now they, they will accumulate uh, in the tumor site. And if they carry the cargo, which then starts releasing itself, then they will uh, impact the tumor growth. And to go even farther and more cleverly about the design of these particles, you can use only the effect which I described, or you can put a so-called targeting moieties on the particle, which will uh, attach like a hook to uh, specific biological entities which appear on the tumor cells, but do not appear on the healthy cells. And that's shown in the middle cartoon here, and uh, that's a phenomena called active tumor targeting. So particles carry uh, a particular biological entity which is capable of recognizing matching entity on the surface uh, of the tumor cell, and the likelihood of them meeting will be higher than in case of passive targeting when uh, when particles only escape the vasculature and end up in the proximity of the tumor. Uh, and in the last uh, uh, graph on the right-hand side of the slide, you can also target uh, walls of uh, the vasculature itself, and that will prompt the particles to departing the uh, blood flow in addition to porous walls uh, of, uh, of the vasculature. So in other words, uh, it's almost like a plug and play. You can build these particles, or not only can, but should build the particle in such a way that they have appropriate uh, size and shape. Uh, and uh, uh, they're designed in such a way from the uh, standpoint of surface chemistry that they could circulate for a long time in the bloodstream. And then they carry appropriate uh, uh, biological entities on their surfaces. Uh, on one hand, those entities allow to, uh, for the particles to um, anchor in the tumor site. On the other hand, uh, provide uh, uh, a therapeutic intervention. Uh, and again, because it's plug and play, uh, there are different flavors to it. Uh, the um, <clears throat> particle which is de described uh, or shown in the slide on the left side is a particle which carries targeting moiety, which was shown in the previous slides, imaging agent, which will allow to show where the particle ended up, and also the therapeutic uh, cargo, which in this case is a drug called methotrexate. Uh, and uh, uh, again, it will go through the process which I described in the previous slide and uh, end up uh, uh, in the tumor side with, with certain probability. But you can also build this therapy in a slightly different way when the particle doesn't have a therapeutic cargo. In other words, it doesn't carry uh, the, the drug molecule on it, but it's built in such a way that after uh, injection and circulation and accumulation at the tumor site, you uh, bring an external trigger which allows to change the temperature of the particle. And the particle which, we are which I'm describing here uh, is called nanoshell, and it's a combination of <clears throat> silica um, uh, core and gold shell. Uh, and again, depending on the ratio of those two layers, a uh, particle like that can absorb light at different wavelengths that's shown uh, in the graph here. Uh, and if you shine uh, that particle with the light of appropriate wavelengths, uh, then uh, the light will be absorbed and the temperature of the particle will go up. If the temperature of the particle go up by a few to 15 degrees, uh, and this particle is in, the, is in the close proximity of the tumor cell uh, and is anchored there, it will eradicate this tumor cell preferentially without impacting too many healthy cells. And similar embodiment can be produced with different particles um, using, for example, iron oxide particles, and uh, then you can use RF heating coil, which will again couple RF energy to the particle, and again, it will increase the temperature of it. So the, the end uh, <clears throat> effect will be the same as using uh, gold nanoshells and the laser light, but the, moda the modality of heating will be, will be different. Uh, so again, there are different ways of approaching the goal, and the goal is 
to accumulate the particles at the tumor site and then uh, use the particles properties or the cargo which are which is carried by the particles to impact uh, and uh, uh, growth of the tumor to reduce the growth of the tumor and erad eradicate the tumor. So a few slides before I describe a number of different materials which can be used for a drug delivery like that. And there was probably 10 or 12 of those. I will briefly describe here only few uh, because again, the purpose of this uh, uh, discussion is not to get into the very detail of how these materials are made or what they are, but what they can be used for. Uh, and the, the final goal of using them is the um, improved uh, therapeutic action. Uh, so one of the uh, types of particles which I described or talked about was uh, dendrimers. These are very elegant branching molecules because they're uh, <clears throat> grown as layers and layers of, of uh, polymeric branches, you can control their size very carefully and depending on how many uh, <clears throat> layers you build upon them, uh, that, uh, that size will change. Um, and, um, and they were proposed uh, um, and, and, and synthesized first in, in the 70s and now uh, they are made in a number of different labs. And of course, drug delivery is only one of their applications. Uh, the other very different material uh, is quantum dots. This, this, they are made from inorganic uh, semiconductor crystals. Um, and uh, what is interesting about them is that depending on how big the crystal is, even if you make the same, um, uh, if it, even if it's made from the same material, uh, the emission, uh, the, the emission wavelengths of the crystal will, will vary. This is different than uh, the lecture which you heard in the same series about light emitting diodes. Over there, you can emit light at different wavelengths, but you have to change uh, the, uh, the material which is involved in the emission uh, because specific wavelengths will be associated with the composition of the material, but material is in bulk. But now when you impose the laws of quantum uh, physics, uh, on these small crystals, then you get uh, additional degree of freedom in the design. And when you change the size, you will also change the wavelengths, even if it is the same uh, material. And now, of course, this, uh, uh, as you see here in the graph, uh, by varying the um, <clears throat> size of the crystal, you will change the emission across the visible spectrum. Uh, we are able to, um, emit light of different colors. Uh, and if you, similarly to uh, nanoparticles described in previous slides, attach different uh, <clears throat> uh, biological targeting uh, entities, um, you can use them also in vivo uh, and uh, use them for optical imaging. Uh, if you will uh, attach a targeting moiety uh, to them, that they will be able to be delivered and again accumulated the tumor uh, and image the tumor. That uh, can be done for uh, well in research purposes. Uh, some of the, most of the quantum dots which were developed uh, early, about uh, 10 to 15 years ago, uh, contain cadmium. Cadmium at larger quantities will be toxic. So of course for imaging in humans, uh, that is not uh, being used, but there is a lot of work now to develop materials, develop quantum dots which will not contain cadmium, cadmium and as such will be uh, will be much less toxic, or they can also be uh, coated with different materials which will make them uh, <clears throat> much less toxic. And the last material, which in a way I already described, is a combination uh, of two materials, silica and, and gold uh, coating, uh, and they are capable of uh, um, absorbing light, which can be used um, in therapy. Uh, the entirely different way of waking, uh, making this material, and interesting one, uh, and interesting for a number of reasons, also for the reason that 
it ties it to more traditional material science and and uh, lithographic fabrication which has been widely used in semiconductor industry uh, where uh, you use basically lithographic mask and uh, for definition of the features on the wafer uh, in this particular case you uh, uh, pour uh, polymer over the wafer and then um, use lithography to define uh, shapes in this polymer uh, and uh, after <clears throat> um, etching and removal parts which were um, mm, uh, exposed you will see a series of number of different features across the wafer uh, the size as and shape of these features can be controlled very uh, very well uh, like in lithography and then you can harvest those uh, uh, shapes from the wafer by removing the attachment between the bottom of the post or the bottom of the cube with the uh, base at the wafer and you basically end up with uh, a large set of uh, um, of particles which will have probably more um, exotic shapes than than in other cases described earlier uh, they can be elongated posts, they can be round, they can be square. Um, so again, they provide more uh, degree of freedoms uh, in in the design. So now, on one hand, of course, uh, there's a lot of work which is being done in designing of new materials and understanding how they will uh, interact with biological uh, systems. Uh, and uh, but at the same time the design of these materials has to be done at least from the standpoint of drug delivery uh, in in such a way uh, that uh, they will maximize the effectiveness of the delivery and uh, what you see in this slide the factors which uh, will <clears throat> play a role here is the size and as I said usually for the effective delivery you would like to keep it between 20 and 80 nanometers uh, and as in addition to the size, it will be surface charge, which is depicted here, as well as density uh, of various ligands and also drug molecules, which are attached on the surface of the particles uh, for the effective targeting and effective delivery. Now, of course, these materials will be used eventually in patient's body. So we have to make really sure that they are safe. Uh, and uh, because of that, there is uh, a lot of work which is being uh, carried out to characterize very carefully safety of these materials and their interaction with biological systems. And that usually is done in three different venues. One is uh, their physical chemical characterization, understanding of size, shape, uniformity of and distribution of those for large loss of the particles, uh, their composition, surface chemistry, and so forth. That is probably very well known to materials community. Uh, the other thing, of course, which, which is again under, uh, important from the standpoint of uh, in vivo use, is their interaction with uh, uh, biological cells. And, uh, and that can be studied uh, in in vitro uh, environment, uh, in cell culture environment. And finally, uh, we usually study these materials also in small animals like mice or rats. And from that, we learn uh, what's the bios distribution, which organs these particles end up, how effective they can be removed from, uh, from the body. Uh, and how effective they can be from the uh, standpoint of, of treatment. So that um, feels very important facet of work, which of course always goes hand in hand um, with the development of, of new therapies. So essentially that ends uh, uh, my lecture. Uh, in which I hope I was able to convey to you a number of possible opportunities which nanomaterials and nanoparticles uh, create in medicine for new treatment of different diseases 
the one which I described here was cancer.